The Game of Scandal by Anna Cora Mowat Ritchie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Have you ever played at scandal, friend? Pure must be the heart that feels no sudden pang of conscience at that bomb-like question. But the startling query, in this instance, mildly refers to a game called Scandal, the delight of juveniles too joyous to be very wise. Yet there is wisdom and warning enough in the game itself to force the conclusion that the origin was in the brain of some sage satirist, who hid a sober moral with a sportive mask. The players sit in a row. The one at the head whispers to his neighbor a communication concerning some absent friend. The neighbor whispers the news, as he hears it, to the one next to him, who conveys the intelligence, still in a whisper, to the one nearest. Thus it is imparted again and again until it reaches the end of the line. As the sentence is transmitted from mouth to mouth, it is unintentionally, unavoidably altered. The words have been incorrectly caught by the listening ear. With each repetition they undergo a change. By the time the sentence has traveled to its journey's close, it has passed through so many strange mutations that it bears not the slightest resemblance to the original phrase, Everyone is requested, beginning at the last hearer, to declare what information concerning Mr. Blank, or Mrs. Blank, or Miss Blank, was confided to him, and lo, through these singular transitions, the harmless assertion has become a monstrous slander. This scandal was obviously the offspring of inadvertent, unconscious misrepresentation. As the story is traced back through all its crooked paths, the most hilarious merriment is excited by its odd metamorphosis. The young play this game in jest, for the sake of the mirth it awakens. Their seniors are playing it in sober, fatal earnest, all the world over, and like them for the sake of mere amusement. I, playing it daily without self-reproach, playing it without dreaming that they are coiners of scandal and clippers of reputation, playing it without reflecting that their game can produce more dangerous consequences than the sport of children. Let us not confound these comparatively innocent scandal mongers with that venomous class whose adder stings are aimed with malicious purpose whose upas breath withers the freshest flowers of innocence upon its invisible touch, whose defiled hands stir up mud in the purest streams of life, whose splenic natures are constantly goaded on by envy and armed with the deadly he weapons of hatred against those the sagest poet that the sun ever shone upon tells that there is no Aegeus that can protect even the immaculate. No might, no greatness in mortality, can censure scape back-wounding calmity. The whitest virtue strikes. What king so strong can tie the gall up in the slanderest tongue? Since the world has no social Perseus who can lift up an invincible sword to slay those gorgons, they are not our theme. To them, the players in the world's great game of scandal bear little resemblance. The latter are vivacious, courteous, agreeable, respectable members of society. If the whole truth must be spoken, we are bound to admit that these graceful babblers are chiefly of the gentler sex. Since the world began, women must have had an especial gift of speech, 
For the very name of Eve, according to Bookstore's Hebrew lexicon, is derived from a root which signifies to talk. Thus her temptations to indulge in idle strictures must be greater than those of her more taciturn brother. But the amiable newsmongers who are playing this game of scandal with honeyed lips and smiling eyes mean no harm. Theirs are random errors shot in sport, yet the shaft scathes be the hand by which it is aimed ever so white. Some charming, giddy-pated creature, with unbridled levity of tongue, gives breath to a good story, not particularly good-natured, about certain poor dear friend of hers. The news is whispered in the ear of her next neighbor, kind Miss Clackett, and being imperfectly heard, or not thoroughly understood, undergoes unintentional change, as the famous game we have cited. Mrs. Clackett, with eager volubility, confides the secret to the first person she meets, good Mrs. Grimm. Mrs. Grimm chances to be of a satirical turn of mind and the tale assumes a sarcastic countenance. It is wafted onward, and until it reaches Miss Baum, a very humane and tender-hearted gossip, in her sympathetic bosom, it is weighed down with such pressure of pity that the features of the traveling story are smoothed into a new shape. A few more steps onward, a few more pleasant touches from rosy lips and snowy hands, and the original liniments are wholly obliterated. But is this all? What becomes of the heroine of this game? How will she break loose from the tangled web woven by mere idle talk? Whither will she fly from the stabbing of inconsequent tongues? If her lacerated reputation ever heal, will not those wounds leave a disfiguring scar for life? Fairest prospects have been hopelessly blighted, strongest ties of friendship dissevered, loves transformed to hate, hearts broken, homes made desolate through the daily playing of this merry game of scandal at our firesides, in our walks, in our social gatherings, the most zealous player, having no evil end in view, if told he has dealt a blow to a friend, or done a neighbor wrong, would meet the charge indignant and aghast. Yet the game goes on bravely from day to day. We all play it, quite innocent of malice, give a buffet to the flying tail, and send it onward, half expiring with laughter at the quaint, fantastic shapes it assumes. Without presuming to don the solemn robes of the social reformer, which might float with as little grace as the usurped lion skin in the fable, may we not venture to suggest an antidote to the bane of this popular death-dealing game? We fear it is one almost too simple to strike, yet simplest herbs have counteracted deadliest poisons. It lies in resolutely setting our faces against crediting any injurious rumor by the reflection that the story is, in all probability, an illustration of the marvelous metamorphoses wrought by that magical game of scandal, which we, and all the world, are merrily playing. End of The Game of Scandal by Anna Cora Mawet Ritchie Read by Kelly Taylor Luminous Plants by Dr. Alfred Gradenwitz Read for LibriVox.org Some species of beetles, as is well known, are endowed with a strange luminescence, and the beautiful phenomenon known as phosphorescence of the sea is, in its turn, due to the light given out by certain of the lower organisms. Many organic substances exhibit luminous phenomena of a similar kind, and butcher's meat, at a state of beginning decomposition, 
as well as rotten wood and withered leaves, possess a luminescence readily perceived by the eye when at rest. Naturalists have frequently discussed the question as to what profit those organisms may derive from their remarkable power, and it seems possible that certain animals avail themselves of their luminescence in attacking their prey, frightening their foes, or lighting the environs when seeking their food. Not only the luminescence of insects, but that of other organic substances as well, should be ascribed to a vital process being due to bacteria, that is, to vegetable organisms settling on the surface of the substance in order, thence, to spread to other bodies. Professor H. Mullish of the University of Prague has closely investigated those phenomena of vegetable luminescence during his voyages of discovery in the tropics and after his return to Europe. According to his researches, the luminescence of butcher's meat, so far from being an exceptional phenomenon, is an absolutely general fact, occurring even in the case of relatively fresh meat, which is quite susceptible of being used as food. The bacterium phosphorium, which gives rise to this luminescence, accordingly is a very widespread occurrence, being found in all ice cellars in which the meat, soon after its arrival, is again and again contaminated by those luminous fungi. Eggs kept in salt water and boiled potatoes will take the same characteristic luminescence either spontaneously or on coming into contact with meat, and the same applies to dead sea fish and other sea animals, in the case of which the phenomenon takes place at the very beginning of disintegration, before any bad smell can be noted. Professor Molish, therefore, unhesitatingly asserts that at least during the hot season, a large portion of all the fish in the market is sold in a luminous condition without the knowledge of the public, but without any detriment to health. In contradistinction to sea fish, freshwater fish do not show any spontaneous luminescence, but become luminescent on coming into contact with sea animals or with butcher's meat contaminated by the bacteria. As the presence of free oxygen is required to enable these to give rise to the phenomenon, this would seem to be an oxidation process, in which only the bacteria situated near the surface partake so as to come into contact with atmospheric oxygen. It is true that the amounts of oxygen taking part in the oxidation are extremely small, being detected by no known chemical reagent. Some experimenters have, accordingly, suggested a very intimate connection between this luminosity and the process of respiration, considering the former as the immediate outcome of the latter. Outside of the oxygen, a certain amount of water is indispensable to give rise to the phenomenon, as shown by the fact that bacteria placed on a glass plate, owing to the evaporation of their water, will cease to shine after five to ten minutes, in order to recover their luminosity after some water has been added. Professor Mullish's researches thus show that the luminosity of living organisms is a chemical process, giving rise to the formation of a hypothetical substance in the interior of cells, which, in the presence of free oxygen and water, becomes luminous. This the experimenter calls photogen. The luminosity of animals shows a characteristic difference from that of plants, bacteria, insofar as the former is observed only intermittently, while cultures of bacteria may remain luminescent for months and even years, provided there be a sufficient supply of food. Professor Molish then succeeded in preparing, with a glass flask filled with sterilized gelatin vaccinated with a culture of luminous bacteria, a cold lamp, which, though being of less intensity than the flame of even the smallest candle, perfectly sufficed for scientific researches, photographic purposes, and even for certain practical uses. As luminous beetles have at any time been used by the natives of tropical countries as ornaments, fishing and hunting utensils, and as optical telegraphs in warfare, the possibility of eventually increasing the intensity of those living illuminants sufficiently to allow of a more extensive utilization should by no means be discarded. The most striking difference between this living light and the one given out by other illuminants is the perfect absence of heat rays. 
Nature thus realizes the ideal of modern engineers, namely, the production of light without heat. While being free from any material heat radiation, this light, however, is by no means of simple composition, and, for example, comprises chemical rays. Molish, accordingly, succeeds in photographing luminous cultures in their own light, and various other objects in the light of the bacteria. Living light does not seem to contain any black rays acting on the photographic plate, while its physiological effects are as striking as those of any other light. If, for example, the germs of certain plants, peas, lentils, etc., be placed at 1 to 10 centimeters distance from a living lamp, they are seen during their growth to approach towards the luminous bacteria. Two kinds of plants thus attracting one another in virtue of the radiating energy given out by one of them. End of Luminous Plants by Dr. Alfred Gradenwitz. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mosaics of Ravenna, Italy, an excerpt from Ravenna by Conrado Ricci, translated from the Italian, 1907. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ravenna Felix is the legend stamped on many ancient coins. To recognize the fitness of the epithet, we must look in history for records of Ravenna's past greatness, and in surviving monuments for traces of her splendor. Contrasting her former glory and prosperity with her present solitude and silence, her citizens are reminded of the words ascribed by Dante to the troubled shade of her ill-fated daughter, no greater grief there is than to recall in misery past happiness. The sea, which once bathed her walls and towers, has now withdrawn to a distance of several miles. The crescent-shaped harbor, strengthened by the Emperor Augustus with marble sides to be the station for the Adriatic fleet with its 250 ships, perished under the assaults of man or of the elements, and is now buried under alluvial deposits. Classe, the great seaport, adorned with stately public buildings, with the warehouses of commerce, and the barracks of the Roman soldiery, fell under the Longobard fury of Farwald and Lutbrand, and Caesarea, the suburb on the causeway connecting Classe with Ravenna, flanked by churches and palaces, of which hardly even the names remain, was razed to the ground. The marvelous palace of Theodoric was stripped by Charles the Great of its precious marbles and mosaics. The capital, the bridges, the fountains, the golden gate, stately public edifices and churches, all have disappeared. Ornaments and treasure were abstracted or destroyed in the Middle Ages, during the Renaissance, and in the past century, Lutbrand carried off the Regisol in the sack of the city in the year 1512. The French gathered a rich spoil of silver baldacchini and enameled crosses. The monks sold the treasures of Gala Placidia. So lately as the year 1854, workmen employed to clear a canal broke into fragments an ornament of gold set with garnets believed to have belonged to Theodoric. Her marshy soil and the shallowness of the lagoons which surrounded her were at once the safety and the destruction of Ravenna. The swamps protected her on the land side. The shallow sea forbade hostile fleets to approach her. Seeking a place of refuge, secure against surprise, the latest emperors and afterwards barbarian kings here established their capital. The seat of imperial government was transferred from Rome to Ravenna by the Emperor Honorius about the beginning of the 5th century, and three important periods in the history of art 
subsequent to that date may be noted. The first of these periods, which we shall call the Roman, extends to the year 476, when the line of the Roman emperors of the West terminated with the overthrow of Romulus Augustulus by Odoacer. This period of about 75 years includes the names of Honorius, Gala Placidia, and Valentinian III. The second period, which we may call the Barbaric, and which lasted for 72 years, is the age of Odoacer, Theodoric, and other Gothic kings. The third period is notable for the reconquest of Italy by Belisarius and Narsus during the reigns of Justinian and Justin, after whose time the fortunes of the city constantly decline. As in the first of the three periods which I have marked out for notice, tradition centers in Placidia, so in the second its interest for the people of Ravenna is summed up in Theodoric, whose name at this day is as familiar in that city as though he were still a living prince, or had been dead so short a time that old men could still remember him. It was his ambition to resemble the great Roman emperors, and refined by his Byzantine education, he took singular delight in cultivating the arts, and in adorning his favorite city of residence with those superb monuments of which I am about to speak. A marvelous edifice is the church first dedicated to the Savior by Theodoric, consecrated later to St. Martin, when from the decoration of its roof it took the name of San Martino de Cielo Gioro, and again consecrated in the name it now bears of San Apollinaire Nuovo. Of the original building erected by Theodoric to be the church of his court and enclosed by him, within the ambit of his palace, nothing decorative is seen externally, since both the portico and the bifora, window with two lights, are of the Renaissance, while the round bell tower, shaped like a minaret and entirely eastern in aspect, probably dates from the ninth century when bells came into general use. As we enter between the rows of columns said to have been brought from the Villa Pinciana in Rome and contemplate the splendor of the mosaics, the architectural and decorative taste of the artists employed by the Romanized Goth come upon us as a complete surprise. Above the windows and below the vault of the apse, originally adorned with mosaics like the walls of the nave, was formerly to be read the inscription, Theodoricus Rex, Anc Ecclesium a Fundamentis in Nomini Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, Facit. In his scheme of mosaic decoration, Theodoric divided both walls of the nave of the church into three zones. In the uppermost zone of the left-hand wall are thirteen designs, each illustrating a parable, a miracle, or some other incident in the life of Christ. In the middle zone are figured sixteen holy personages, prophets and saints. In the lowest zone we see at one end the city of Classe, with its harbor and lighthouses, at the other the virgin and child, seated between angels. Similarly, on the uppermost zone of the right-hand wall are thirteen groups, representing incidents in the Passion of our Lord, or subsequent to his resurrection. In the middle zone are other sixteen holy personages, while in the lowest zone are, seen at one end, the Savior, seated between angels, at the other end the palace of Theodoric, with the churches of Ravenna rising behind it. The mosaics of the uppermost and middle zones of both walls remain almost wholly intact, as do also the designs at the ends of the lowest zones. But in the greater part of the intervening space in these last, the work of Theodoric's artist has been replaced by other work of half a century later. Under the colonnades of the palace as originally depicted were seated diverse personages of the Gothic court. 
above the curtains added by later artists vestiges of six heads can be discerned and traces of three hands are still visible on the columns the figure of theodoric on horseback has likewise been removed from the pediment of the palace and from under the gate of the city another larger seated figure the outline of which can still be traced but no trace remains of the mosaics which originally adorned the wide spaces extending between the saviour and the palace on the right-hand wall or between the madonna and the city of classe on the left-hand wall of the nave at the present day we see in their place on the left a long row or procession of virgins on the right a similar file of martyrs but these are substituted work of the second half of the sixth century the original decorations occupying these spaces have been wholly obliterated from which it may be inferred that these decorations represented either subjects illustrating tenets of the arian belief or more probably incidents in the life of theodoric himself but if so why should these have been cancelled and others substituted theodoric died execrated by the orthodox church not so much perhaps for the arian tenets he professed as for the cruel persecutions which stained the closing years of his life more especially the martyrdoms of boethius symmachus and pope john i consequently every reference in art to his person his triumphs or his faith became hateful and was suppressed the old chronicler agnello testifies to this when he relates that the archbishop bearing the same name as himself about the year 560 reconsecrated this and other churches of the goths a little before he had mentioned among the churches expurgated by the archbishop this church of san martin in cielo gioro the period intervening between theodoric's death and the archbishop's accession to the episcopal throne was a brief one barely thirty years but within that short space of time most momentous changes had taken place in the government in the form of faith and in the art of ravenna the goths had been vanquished and driven out of italy the byzantines under belisarius and narsus had entered on possession bringing with them a new splendor and new artistic feeling developed to their fullest extent in the decoration of the churches of san michele in afrisisco san vitale and san apollinaire in classe and of all the other churches of ravenna which were completed between the years 540 and 547 by julian the treasurer the difference existing between the mosaic work of ravenna under the rule of the late western emperors and of the goths and that executed after the re-establishment of the eastern empire and the institution of the exarchs is clearly seen when studied in their form feeling technique and even in their material substance and confirms what we are told by cassiodorus and by other writers that theodoric partly from individual taste partly from policy employed roman artists direct inspection of the work itself is of more importance in this case than any other evidence and it is surprising to find how long the obvious difference to which i refer has escaped the eyes of the historian and the art critic laying aside therefore for the present the study of those other monuments in ravenna in which traditional roman forms everywhere prevail as in the mausoleum of placidia in the baptistery of the cathedral and elsewhere let us limit ourselves wholly to confronting the two styles as they are seen in the church of san apollinaire nuovo that portion of its mosaic work which we may call roman rejects all ornament and seems to borrow its forms from statuary the figures of the prophets in full face wrapped in their mantles with a book or a scroll in their hands seem true and direct reproductions of statues the chiaroscuro is scarcely interrupted by the rose in their flesh tints 
or the red in the binding of their books. Standing firmly on a ground representing the base in perspective, they vary the pose of their hands and the sweep of their robes in attitudes which are all to be seen in ancient sculptures. The folds of their garments, admirably shaded in varying gradations of tone, reveal with accuracy the forms they cover. Their heads, well set upon strong necks, when viewed closely, show an ample scale of tints, as many as fourteen, full of force and daring in the use of purples and violets. Their hair curls and clusters in natural curves. The same art is revealed in the designs of the uppermost zones, though as these include groups of figures and rural backgrounds, the coloring is a little more varied, but always without decorative excess, without violent tones, discreet, harmonious. Very different methods and artistic ideals are shown in the two files of figures in the lowest zones already referred to as representing virgins and martyrs. The points of junction with the original mosaics are plainly seen, and the different quality of the mastic. All care for form seems to be lost in the anxiety to produce decorative effect. The figures succeed one another without variety, as though all were cast in the same mold. The sense of chiaroscuro has almost entirely disappeared. The folds of the white robes of the martyrs are indicated by long, dry, angular, unshaded lines, often greatly disfiguring the person. The hands are all alike, the feet heavy, clumsy, sometimes deformed. The hair on the misshapen heads resembles the tiny skull caps worn by priests. The flesh tints have no chromatic variety, but are based on four or five tones at most. The virgins opposite doubtless produce a different effect, but not because their forms are better. They surprise and dazzle by the splendor of their robes embroidered with gold and flowers, of their diadems, necklaces, and girdles glittering with gold and gems. The very ground on which they tread is sprinkled with flowers, while the delicate interlacing overhead of the palm branches laden with fruit heightens the glow of this marvelous, ineffable procession, which, from the monotonous repetition of a single figure, acquires something of a musical rhythm, a sameness as of a litany, surprising and exalting. But the beauty is wholly decorative, not of form. It might be said that, as with the Roman artists, the feeling for form has been inspired by severe classical sculpture, so with the Byzantines, the decorative influence has been imparted in contemplating the gorgeous textures of the East. The chromatic diversity of the tesserae, which enabled the Byzantine to express an infinity of details, serves the Roman artist to model better and to throw into relief. In the female figures of the uppermost zones, we find no luxury of ornament. The lightness of their vestments and transparency of their flesh is attained by the union and fusion of many tints, whereas in the faces of the virgins, mouth, eyes, and nose are indicated by outline rather than by shading, so that while for their flesh two or three tones only suffice to pass from red to white, a hundred vivid colors and a bountiful profusion of discs of mother-of-pearl seem hardly enough to furnish the gems and embroideries of their garments. We must, however, recognize that if in design, and so to speak in substance, the mosaic work of the Roman tradition is more solid and beautiful, the Byzantine, with its unrestrained luxury of ornament, is more magnificent, and consequently more decorative. Be this as it may, no cloth of gold could spread itself out more superbly than do these mosaics, wherein are depicted the king's palace and the churches of Ravenna, the harbor with its ships and lighthouses, the walls and Roman buildings of Classe, the long files of martyrs and virgins, 
the wise kings of the east following their guiding star, the Madonna and child, the Redeemer seated between angels, above these the prophets and holy fathers of the church, still higher the small well-filled designs illustrating the life of Christ, his parables and miracles. The man, sick of the palsy, takes up his bed and walks. The man, possessed with devils, has them cast out when they enter into the herd of swine which rushes down into the sea. The paralytic of Capernaum is let down from the roof to be healed by Christ. Christ sits as judge and divides the sheep from the goats. In this mosaic, the angel on Christ's right hand, who has charge of the sheep, is radiant in robes, flesh tints, and aureole. The angel on the left, who has charge of the goats, is overshadowed, as it were, by a livid purple light diffused over his whole person. The poor widow of the parable gives her might. The Pharisee, with upraised hands, stands by the temple gate and thanks God that he is not as other men are, while the publican, with bent head, smites his breast and prays God to be merciful to him, a sinner. Swathed in grave clothes, Revealing his wasted frame, Lazarus comes forth from the tomb. The woman of Samaria, in a garment of varying hue, stands by Jacob's well, holding in her hands the pitcher of water she has just drawn, while she looks at and converses with our Savior. The woman who has suffered from an issue of blood for twelve years touches the hem of Christ's mantle and is healed. The two blind men of Jericho raise their sad faces in anxiety to know whether their sight is to be restored. White-haired Peter and Andrew, with rough gray locks, leave their nets to follow Christ and become fishers of men. Christ holds in his hand the five loaves and the two fishes wherewith the multitude is to be fed. In the final group on the left wall of the nave, is the figure of a youth presenting baskets to Christ. Archaeologists have hazarded many conjectures as to the occasion to which the picture refers. All, however, have agreed in believing that the figures of Christ and the disciple have been renewed, while that of the youth bending down is ancient and might possibly form part of a representation of Christ's entry into Jerusalem. Careful examination, however, reverses this judgment. The figures of Christ and the disciple are ancient. The youth and the baskets are restorations of last century. These baskets, altered by an ignorant restorer, were the jars containing the water which was changed into wine at the marriage in Cana of Galilee. The bent figure is that of the serving man who is testing the miraculous liquid. On the opposite wall of the church, we have the tragic presentment of Christ's last sad days upon earth, during which more mundane matters fail to receive his attention. His neglected beard grows rough and ragged, revealing perhaps the Arian belief that the Son is not of the same divine essence as the Father. In the first group, we have the representation of the Last Supper. The disciples recline on the triclinium. Christ has said that one of them will betray him. Some look inquiringly at their master. Others cast withering glances at the suspected traitor. In the next group, Christ with eleven of his disciples are seen on the Mount of Olives. The kiss of Judas, whose treachery is expressed in every line of his face and figure, Christ is led off to the judgment seat. He stands before Caiaphas and Sanhedrin. He foretells that Peter will deny him. Peter denies his Lord. Judas offers back the price of betrayal. Pilate washes his hands. Christ is led to Calvary. The women weep at the sepulchre. Finally, two simple and serene compositions, the disciples journey to Emmaus, and Christ shows his wounds to doubting Thomas. End of The Mosaics of Ravenna, Italy, an excerpt from Ravenna, 
by Conrado Ricci, translated from the Italian, 1907, read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson. The Murder Trial of James Sullivan by Anonymous from the New York Times, September 24th, 1851. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oyer and Terminer, Tuesday, before Chief Justice Edmonds, Alderman Kelly and Chapman. The court met at 10 a.m. The district attorney called on the case of Antoine Lopez, indicted for the murder of Michael Foster, 4th Ward Policeman. 